Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. So I've got a really nice ring theory problem for you guys today. So ring theory is a topic in abstract algebra. And in fact, this is a really famous exercise from an equally famous abstract algebra textbook by Herstein. And it's called Topics in Algebra. So what's our goal? Our goal is to show that if R is a ring such that for all little r in R, we have R cubed equals R, then R is commutative. Okay, well, let's parse some of that out here by looking at the definition of a ring first. So a ring is a set R together with two operations, addition and multiplication, such that R together with addition is an abelian group. So what do we mean to be an abelian group? Well, we mean that zero is an element from R. So in other words, we have an additive identity. So R plus zero is R. Next, we know that everything has an additive inverse. So we'll say if R is in R, then minus R is in R, where if you add those two things, you get zero. You get back to the additive identity. And then next, we have associativity of our addition. So for all Q, R, and S in R, we have Q plus R plus S is the same thing as Q plus R plus S. And then furthermore, this being an abelian group means that R plus S equals S plus R. So I'll fit that in right there. Okay, so that takes care of our addition operation. Now what about our multiplication operation? Well, we don't have quite as many characteristics or rules that that has to follow, but we do have a couple. And so for all Q, R, and S, we have associativity of multiplication. So Q times R times S is the same thing as Q times R times S. And then we've got these two distributive rules. So we have Q times R plus S is the same thing as Q times R plus Q times S. And then we've got this distributive rule from the right-hand side as well. And then I'd like to point out that we say that R is commutative. So I'll just say commutative if RS equals SR for all R and S in R. So when we're saying a ring is commutative, we're talking about the multiplication, not the addition, because it's always commutative with respect to the addition. Now, if you'd like to learn more abstract algebra, in particular group theory, you could check out today's sponsor, Brilliant. So they have math courses at all levels, including some math courses on group theory and all the prerequisites that you would need to learn to learn group theory, like how to write mathematical proofs or some basic number theory or contest math or even like linear algebra and differential equations if that is more your speed. And in fact, Brilliant is a great great platform to learn about all of these subjects. They have great hands-on lessons that really help you build a strong intuition for subjects in mathematics. And in fact, they've got other sciences as well and computer science. So what are you waiting for? To get started for free, go to brilliant.org slash Michael Penn or click the link in the description. In fact, the first 200 people to click this link will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. That's a really good deal. And I'd like to thank Brilliant one more time for sponsoring today's video before jumping back into this problem. One more thing before we jump into our solution, and that would be some examples of rings. So a great way to think about any sort of algebraic structure is the simplest type of algebraic structure that this thing is like really trying to generalize. And I would say that at their heart, all rings are generalizations of the integers. So the integers are obviously a commutative ring. They've got some other properties as well, but this is like maybe the canonical example of a ring. It clearly satisfies all of the rules. In particular, if we have an integer L times an integer M plus N, we clearly get L plus LM plus LN. That's just the standard distributive rule that you would learn like in grade school. So I'll just say plus all other things that we need. So needless to say, the integers form a ring. 
Well, in fact, the integers modulo n for any n also form a ring. And there's actually something pretty interesting about this ring, and that is you can have two non-zero elements that multiply to a zero element. So let's maybe look at an example of that going on. We could take the number three and the number four inside of Z12, and we could note that three is not equal to zero and four is not equal to zero inside of this ring. But three times four is in fact equal to 12, which is zero in Z12. So that makes Z12 an example of a ring which is not a so-called integral domain. Then maybe for another example, we could look at n by n integers where the coefficient n by n matrices where the coefficients come from the integers. Really, we could put any ring we wanted to there, including maybe even the real numbers if we would like. So this thing is not a commutative ring. It in fact has this property too. It is not a so-called integral domain. You can multiply non-zero elements and get the zero element, but I'll just point out that A times B is not equal to B times A in general here. Like I said, it's not a commutative ring. Okay, and then here's another kind of fancier ring, which I'll say is Z adjoin the dihedral group. So this is an example of a so-called group ring. It's a little bit more of a fancy example, but I'll just put it there and not really say much more about it. I think uh, group rings provide excellent examples of other non-commutative rings. Okay, so now that we're all warmed up, let's jump into the solution of this famous exercise. So in order to efficiently work through this solution, we're gonna use the following two lemmas. And the first one says that for all elements of our ring R, which I'll call little r, we have three times the quantity R plus R squared equals zero. Now you might say, well, what do I mean by three times this, given that I've got an abstract ring here, and if I have an abstract ring here, what is the meaning of the number three? Well, I'll just point that out right here. So maybe I'll just put this as a note. If we think of n r, where n is an integer, that's gonna be defined as r plus r plus r, how many times? n times. And so that's clear if that's a positive integer, but if that's a negative integer, we just in fact take negative r minus r minus r and so on and so forth. So let's maybe clear that up by saying that this is just a natural number. So, for example, we have like three times r is really just defined to be r plus r plus r. So whenever you see three times r or two times r or six times r or so on and so forth, in the setting of this proof, you wanna decode that into r added to itself three times or two times or six times, just depending on what uh, the number is. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's look at the proof of lemma one. Okay, so let's first note that r plus r squared is the same thing as r plus r squared cubed. So that's just replacing like our defining relation of our ring that everything cubes to itself where we've replaced r with this r plus r squared. Okay, but now we can multiply this out using something like the binomial theorem. That'll give us r cubed plus 3r to the fourth plus 3r to the fifth plus r to the sixth. So powers of r commute with each other. That's why we don't have to worry about getting more terms here. Okay, great. But now we can maybe expand each of these. So notice r to the fourth is the same thing as r cubed times r. r to the fifth is the same thing as r cubed times r squared. And then r to the sixth is the same thing as r cubed times r cubed. But now we'll use the fact that r cubed is equal to r and replace each of those instances of r cubed with r. So let's see, that'll give us just r here, and then we'll have plus 3r squared for this term because this guy right here turns, turns into r. And then here we'll have 
r cubed, which is r, times r squared. So that's going to be another r cubed, which is just will be r. So 3r, and then similarly, this will be r squared. So now let's see, putting this all together, we'll get 4r plus 4r squared. But now we can subtract this left-hand side from this right-hand side, and that'll give us exactly 3r plus r squared equals zero, which is what we wanted for this first lemma. Now we're ready to look at the proof of lemma two, which says for all little r in r, we have six r equals zero. So in other words, if we add r to itself six times, we get zero. So this one's in fact like even a little bit quicker. So let's notice we can take 6r and we can rewrite that as 8r minus 2r. So that's pretty clear. But now we can take that 8 and rewrite it as 2 cubed. We can take that r and rewrite it as r cubed minus 2r. We can factor that cube out giving us 2r cubed minus 2r. But 2r, or in other words, r plus r, is most definitely an element from r, so that means it cubes to itself. So this gives us 2r minus 2r, which is in fact zero. And that's what we needed for this second lemma. Now that we're armed with our review of rings, as well as our preparatory lemmas, we're ready to prove our main result, which says that r is a commutative ring. But I've written that up kind of in words up here. So for all a and b in r, we have AB equals BA. In other words, AB minus BA is zero. And we'll in fact prove this version of the statement over here, but that's equivalent to this being a commutative ring. Okay, so let's see how this proof goes. So let's start by supposing that we have arbitrary A and B in R. And let's notice that A plus B is the same thing as A plus B cubed. And then furthermore, a minus b is the same thing as a minus b cubed. So that's from our defining relation of our ring over here. Okay, so let's multiply each of these out. So this one will multiply out to a cubed plus a squared b plus a b a plus, let's see, next will be b a squared. Okay, so that's everything of the form that we have two multiples of a and one multiple of b. Notice that we can't do any commutativity here, so we have to leave it like that because a priori, we do not know that this is a commutative ring. Okay, so we've got some more terms. We have plus a b squared plus b a b and then finally plus b squared a and then b cubed. Okay, so that's what we get if we multiply this thing out. Now let's multiply this thing out and see what happens. So we'll have a cubed, and then if we're taking two a's, then that means we're taking one b, which means we'll have a bunch of negative terms. So this will be minus a squared b, minus a b a, minus b a squared. And then for our next lot of terms, we'll be taking two b's and one a, if we take two b's, then we're squaring minus one, which gives us plus one. So that'll be give us plus a b squared plus b a b plus b squared a, and then we have minus b cubed, because we're taking an odd number of b's. Okay, now we can do a bit of cancellation. Notice that a cubed is the same thing as a, so that means that cancels from both sides of this first equation b cubed is the same thing as b, so that means these cancel. And then also this a is the same thing as a cubed, that makes those cancel. And then finally this negative b is the same thing as this negative b cubed, so that means those cancel. Okay, and now what we'll do is take these remaining expressions and add them. So let's just write that right there that we're gonna add them. Well, over here on the left-hand side, we're left with zero, so that's cool. And on the right-hand side, stuff will cancel as well. And what will that be? Well, everything with a minus sign here has a copy with a plus sign up here, so those will cancel. So this one will cancel this one because they have opposite signs. 
This one will cancel this one because they have opposite signs. And then finally, this one will cancel this one because they have opposite signs. And then we'll just have this thing and this thing add up. But if you look closely, those are exactly the same term. Those are the exactly same trinomial. So that means what we have is two times the quantity AB squared plus BAB plus B squared A is equal to zero. It's equal to zero because that's what we have over here. Now we're gonna take this expression and left and right multiply it by something to give us two new expressions that are equal to zero. So first we will left multiply by B and then over here we'll right multiply by B. So, so at this moment, those are gonna be different actions given we're not assuming commutativity. Okay, left multiplying by B will give us two times the quantity B A B squared. That's what we get for this first term plus B squared A B. That's what we get from the second term plus b cubed a, but b cubed is b because of our defining relation, so that's just b times a. So that's left multiplying. But now right multiplying, which I'll actually write down here on another line, will give us something kind of similar. So here we'll get a b cubed, so that's a b. Here we'll get b a b squared. And then finally here we'll get b squared a b. And that's also equal to zero. But let's look at this. Here we have AB and here we have BA and then everything else is paired off. So here we have BAB squared, here's BAB squared, here we have B squared AB, B squared AB. So that may, motivates us to take the difference of these two equations. So let's see, if we subtract these two equations, we'll be left with two AB minus BA is equal to zero. But that's not quite enough to say that BA minus AB or AB minus BA is equal to zero because we don't know that we have an integral domain or anything. But this is definitely along the path. Okay, so let's maybe bring that up and we'll finish it off. So we just finished showing that two times AB minus BA is equal to zero, and now we're ready to move on to the next step. Notice we haven't used any of these lemmas yet. Well, we're about to use this first lemma. So let's do that. So we'll use this lemma replacing R with A plus B. So we know that zero is equal to three times A plus B plus A plus B quantity squared. Now we're gonna multiply that out. So that'll give us three, and then in here, we'll have a plus b plus a squared plus a b plus b a plus b squared. Again, that's just from doing this binomial expansion in this potentially non-commutative setting. Now we'll rewrite this as three times a plus a squared, taking this a and this a squared plus three times b plus b squared, taking this b and this b squared, and then we'll be left with three times this a b plus b a. So three a b plus b a, good. But now these are like little versions of our lemma over here. So that means those cancel out. So this is equal to zero and as well, this is equal to zero. So that means we have zero equals three a b plus b a. So let's take that down here and we'll have zero is equal to three a b plus three b a. But now let's use lemma two, which we haven't used yet. And that is six times anything from the ring is equal to zero. So that means I can subtract six times anything and it's still gonna be true. So I'll in fact subtract six times BA. So that'll leave me with, because of this cancellation right here, three AB minus BA is equal to zero. And that puts me in a very good situation. Notice I have up here that two times this commutator is equal to zero. Here I have 
three times this commutator is equal to zero. So that means I can take these two and subtract them. Three minus two is clearly equal to one. That gives me AB minus BA is equal to zero, which is the same thing as saying that AB is equal to BA, which is the same thing as saying that this is a commutative ring, given that A and B were chosen arbitrarily. And that's a good place to stop.